Um, thank you, Neha. Thank you, Badmi, uh, for a warm introduction. Um, so, like Neha was mentioning, like we will spend good quality time, probably the next 35 minutes or so, uh, on the content around two sided marketplaces at the highest level. Um, I am going to cover some of the examples. Uh, instead, I thought instead of going down the path of doing a lot of theory, it's always good to look at some of these successful companies and think through how they do growth, right? And how do they get users, even the first user to the 100th user to a million, 100 million users, right? Plus. Um, so we'll go through that journey and, and take some of a couple of examples to really articulate some of the core concepts uh, the companies are using today uh, for delivering growth. Uh, with that, let me quickly share my screen. I hope you all can see the screen. Um, so let's start with some fundamentals, right? What is a marketplace? So a good way to um, answer this question is to look at companies like Airbnb, Amazon, Uber, and there are many, many other big players in this market, right? So basically what you have is you have a company like Airbnb providing a platform. And then you have on both sides, a buyer and a seller, right? In this case, a seller is a host who is hosting their house for, and the buyer is a, is a customer or a traveler who is actually looking for places instead of a hotel, right? So the, the whole concept of marketplace is that, you know, there is a network effect in there. And the business model is built on network effects and more. Right? So, for example, look at the right side of the chart, right? And this is for one of these like marketplaces. And you can see they started in 2008. It took a long time to get meaningful traction, right? In, in like initial 36 months, they were continuing to build liquidity, where which after that you see a much stronger ramp up. This is a very typical um, marketplace, looks like takes a lot of time to get the initial traction. And then as you further increase, like, you know, there is a flywheel effect that gets kicked in, which will increase the number of users as well as on both sides of the marketplace, right? And, and the marketplace is like best categorized as buyers benefit from more sellers and sellers benefit from more buyers, right? In the case of Amazon, you have a lot of, third party sellers like selling small businesses selling through the amazon platform on the other side there are lots of buyers so when buyers look at the market they see lots of options and when sellers look at the market they get a big pool of customers right they compete with other sellers the, the interesting aspect of a marketplace is that it's very difficult to compete with the Netscape because of this flywheel effect and the community that is built around it, right? That's that's all the case, right? Like, look at Airbnb. It's hard to compete, right? Unless you have a lot of money and lots of interest in those areas, like, it, and it takes, like, probably 10 plus years to compete. Amazon, Uber, Lyft, WeWork. Uh, there are many, many, many marketplaces we can, right? So it's difficult to compete, especially once we, once they get into that, momentum right and the beauty of this business and the, the question is like why are these businesses so so interesting for the market the in in for and interesting for vcs right to spend spend a lot of money to just get into the scale right you, you, i mean most of these marketplaces and i'll talk a little bit more in detail about that is in a loss right and there is a reason why it's in a loss, at least in the first probably good percentage of the years they are in the business. Right? The beauty, but the beauty of the model is that once you get it working, right, there is no physical constraints on growth. You know what that means? Like for example, take it Amazon, right? Let's say Amazon is a pure, uh, you know, first party service, right? Where Amazon sells you products directly, and you get one million customers you probably need uh, probably a billion dollars worth of inventory, right? But when it goes into 10 million and 100 million, like 10X or 100X in terms of the customers, 
your inventory also goes up really high. Inventory cost to manage these customers goes high, right? And that that problem of like first party goes away for a platform company, right? Because Airbnb or Uber, they don't own any cars or they don't own any properties, right? The growth is infinite, right? Um, same with Amazon for third party sellers, right? The more sellers come in, the more buyers come in. Buyers and sellers, there is a market dynamics there. So you can really accelerate growth with, with incremental cost, right? That's why it's, it's so attractive, uh, you know, the marketplaces. Um, now, on, on the other side, like why does customers love it? Because customers love it because there is a, a level of trust and identity for each of the supplier in, in the market, right? There are options like Amazon enabled review system, right? Lots of options. There is a healthy market dynamics, right? Price versus price sensitivity. So one player cannot say, I'm gonna charge like 100X on this particular product, right? Because there is a market dynamics to it. And marketplaces are, are also like low friction, right? You know, how easy is it to book a ride on Uber or to, you know, purchase something on, Airbnb or like book something on Airbnb or purchase something on Amazon, right? Lots of transparency, right? This is the reason why people love it and people get closer to it because there is a community aspect to it. Okay, marketplace businesses are very hard. Okay? Like all of these companies you see here, these are all well-known big companies. Probably you have used it like multiple times in the last year, right? There might not be a single person who has either touched one of these. Interesting part, most of these companies are in a loss after running for more than 10 years. Uber is just on the verge of profitability. We, uh, being from Uber, like, you know, I, like we, are, we recently announced that in Q3 this year or Q4, we will get into profitability. Instacart is a private company, so there's not a lot of data around it, but uh, it's well known that Instagram has been burning money and is also in the world of profitability with COVID helping, right? WeWork hasn't made money. DoorDash is probably the only company who turned profitable, profitable in the recent years, okay? Uh, recently, right? The, the reason these businesses are, are hard, our marketplace business are hard to get into profitability is because of the unit economics around it, okay? Um, I'll give you a very good example with WeWork. I used to uh, run the product strategy for WeWork. Um, so when you think about WeWork as a unit economics, like um, the model WeWork works is like they go to commercial businesses, large buildings, take these buildings for a very long-term lease at very attractive prices because of the long, long longevity of the lease. When they sign the lease, after signing the lease, what they do is the payment starts after signing the lease, right? Let's say I start the lease today in an in amazing building in downtown San Francisco, right? It takes probably six to 12 months or probably 18 months just to redo the space in the form we work wants to sell it, right? So there is that period of time where you owe payments on these commercial leases. And then, it probably takes another three to six months to get people into the building, right? Like, you know, selling into businesses, selling into individual players. And they probably take another, you know, three to six months to move in, right? When the payment is due for that, right? So if you look at unit economics for a building, it basically takes anywhere between one and a half years to two and a half years after signing the initial lease to get tenants in there and start you know, and getting the occupancy up to, you know, 75, 80, 90, 95%, right? Which is when you start making money, right? Which is why the unit economics for this building, right? It takes a long time. And if you have to think about it in scale, like when we were used to have like 600 plus building globally, right? It takes a long time to get into profitability, right? That's the same math across each of these companies, right? Now let's, let's quickly shift the topic into growth. Right. This is a typical growth curve around unit economics. Okay. What does this mean, right? In the WeWork example, you can see that there is a acquisition cost 
for the building it takes like few years to break even right or as the tenants continue to pay the monthly recurring revenue has to overcome the initial loss that you incurred while you purchased the property or you know signed the lease so in the case of uber or in the case of airbnb it's a customer acquisition cost for example let's say you acquire a customer for $1000 right you you want to get enough money from that customer to break even that $1000 and that takes a certain period of time right and then you get it into profitability right so couple of important metrics here is we want to reduce churn because if if the customer churns before converting into profitability right you lost all your customer acquisition cost there right that's a loss making customer but if the customer has a longevity like lifetime value greater than i think in this particular case like greater than 3 years right you then start making money continuously right because your fixed cost is covered so it's that unit economics that plays really big into many of these businesses okay. so the, there is a big question right how do we start uh, to cyber marketplace right um one it's hard right it's a, it's a chicken and egg problem right you, you need to invest on both sides of the market but what we have seen from the industry is that there was recently a survey done and there were approximately like 30 35% of the top 100 marketplaces they focused on one side of the equation first okay usually people say supply is the key right so the companies focus on supply airbnb for example they focused heavily on getting hosts onto the marketplace right uber they there is a heavy focus on getting more drivers into the thing right? and then customers would come right so usually people start or companies who have started start with going after a particular niche in a in a particular market very constrained environment like you know things like in chicago you know a small place in chicago with a particular subset of the customers right that's how you start and then you have a build a community to continue to attract right um and it's a classic chicken and egg problem because you know host will not come in or supply side will not come in unless you have customers right and uh, and there are few ways you can manage that right here are a few examples like open table right open table um i, I don't know whether you guys have used it like it's a it's basically like you can book a restaurant reservation on an open table right? so in the cases there are two it's a two sided marketplace with people who wanted to dine in in a restaurant and the restaurant who is providing service right so they started with selling software into restaurants they didn't focus on getting diners in okay. they got a good mass of customers selling their saas software to manage a restaurant reservation process and you know crm and other things when they got enough mass then they realized that hey i can build another adjacent business to get diners in as well right which makes it more attractive to the customer their customers who are restaurants right? uber they actually focused on a similar product they also focused on initially like people who provide a limo service right a lot of drivers with a car and during the service like there was a lot of time where they were idle right so uber's approach was like hey here is a smartphone here is an app you want to open and at the time you are idle just open up the app you might get a right that makes per- perfect sense right for drivers who are at home you're like yeah that makes a lot of sense anyway i'm here let me just open up any new customer coming in to my unsold inventory which is time is just more profit for me right we talked about amazon groupon is another one right groupon started with selling gift cards right and merchants merchants there are high period as well as low period right and during low period if they are getting more customers the merchants are super happy so you are willing to give away their gift cards at a lower price and those were the gift cards that they sold to the customers right so they got the merchants to adopt first right? so 
if you look at all these examples one thing is very clear right a lot of these examples and again this is not the only way to do it right so do not take it like that right we are always reflecting on some of the industry examples to build a case for this right um in in all of these examples like you focused on one side of the market right? you also focused on unsold inventory which makes it like frictionless for others to onboard onto the platform right that's one way to grow right or at least to start the business now there is a big question around how do we continue to grow the business right a, a good growth framework that all, all of these like large companies focus on is as follows right you need user acquisition right you need lots of new users to come to the platform you then once people are on the platform you need them to take the first product in, right first time you want to transact so that's what we call some activation and once you are on the platform now you have activated you your purchase you have made your first purchase the companies focus on retention exactly for the unit economics that we talked about earlier right we want them to continue engaging on the platform as much as possible right you want them to become a repeat customer right so for uber that is me that means that we want a customer to use uber as many times as possible in a month right and have across as many use cases as possible as well then eventually then you start focusing on scale and scale includes multiple things right scale includes hey you have been you identify one area you move to next area to do the same thing you, you expand to multiple cities expand to multiple countries right that's one way to scale the other way to scale is in the retention part where users come in uh, they take the first service let's say i Uh, I am a user. I wanted to, as a Uber customer, I wanted to go to my office, or I wanted to go to airport. Okay, I got that use case. Right, any time I am going to airport, I think about Uber and look at it. But today, I use my car to go to commute, right, to my office. The next thing Uber would think about is like, how can I build a service at a proper cost basis, so that I change using my car. and getting away from car ownership on to using uber to go to office every time right so that's the part where companies continue to invest so that you continue to spend more money on the platform for airbnb the answer is experiences they recently start with experiences you go to a particular place uh you book airbnb you go to a particular place uh, let's say you go to chicago and you are a tourist there your first immediate need is to you know see other places so there is an immediate need that airbnb can address otherwise i am going to do outside of that okay so that is one way to deliver engagement for we work we work large enterprise customers or we work customers came in to we work to get the real estate space but what we were also invested is technology product that you can upsell into your customers right so that's how you continue to get increase one increase the customer lifetime value increase the average spend on the platform plus continue to get more use cases through the platform right that is the methodology of growth right so anything and everything each of these companies do fits into these four categories broadly um amazon another good example right um the amazon flywheelers um, um i believe jeff bezos introduced the concept of flywheel long time back probably 10 years a decade before it's still like uh, a blueprint for a lot of these companies like how do we accomplish a flywheel effect right so look at that right on one side you have the sellers on the other side if you provide like really good customer experience and the way you provide customer experiences you lower the prices or you be aggressive on the prices you have a lot of selection 
and which will overall lead a low cost structure, right? You have a low cost structure means lower prices, increased customer experience. You have lots of sellers means you have lots of selection and increases the customer experience. That increases the traffic that brings in a lot more sellers, right? And you continue to make this happen, right? It's the same thing for Uber. This was written on a napkin like you know a few years back as the first model for Uber. How do we think about Uber's flywheel effect? Right? On one side you have drivers. How do you attract more drivers? There is more demand. Right? How do you attract more demand? It's like faster pickups. You need something immediately. Reasonable prices, like you know, lower prices. Right? And the lower prices. How do you accomplish lower prices? Is by making sure drivers have lot more runtime and a lot more geographical coverage that will lead to um, you know less downtime on a driver so at the end of the day driver wants to make certain amount of money right so you have low downtime on driver means lower prices for the customer that means more demand more drivers come in drivers also make money customers also like they have cheaper prices and they'll continue to engage on the platform and there is like geographical density to it right density is an important component at least for Uber. I hope this makes sense. Okay, so I I thought you know um, instead of talking too much about Uber, uh, I'm closely associated with many things Uber does, and uh, I cannot publicly talk about it. I thought I would take a industry example, which is well documented, as a case study around how Airbnb did recently okay, to deliver growth. Okay. Um, what you're seeing here is 2021 quarterly results August. Okay. They had a revenue of approximately $1.3 billion in that quarter. So it's not really a big company. Like for example, Uber has a run rate of like, you know, 50 million just on the, 50 billion just on the mobility side of the business. Okay, I mean, the, for the car, car side of the business. So they have 1.3 billion means like approximately like, you know, six to $7 billion in annual run rate. Um, and that is in Q2. Okay? Compared to Q2 2022, which was 335 million, so there is almost a 4x okay, over the pandemic period. What is the loss? Net loss of 68 million in August 2021, compared to 500 million or so in Q2 2022. Right? And if you go back one more year, that was 229 million in loss. So you can see, right? If you look at the loss from 29. 2019 to till late against the same quarter. It was 229 million in 2019, increased to 500 million in 2020 during the pandemic. And then now they are recovering to 68 million. Okay. It shows a couple of things. Okay. They have done something really well during the pandemic to enable the customer use cases to recover their business. Right. They were still not profitable in 2019 when the pandemic was not there. Right. They were losing like approximately 200 plus million in a quarter. Okay. So that's the company. Right. It's a good story of a company was running on loss in 2019. The losses significantly increased during pandemic. And post pandemic, companies recovering. Okay. Approximately 4 million posts just to get you a scale of things. Right. So now um, let's talk about what really happened during COVID, okay? March, 2020, uh, COVID hit, right? Revenues declined, bookings were down by 72%. Just think about that, right? In a year, in a particular, when an external you know, condition happened, company, three fourths of the company's business is lost almost. 2020, that revenue recovered to 22% decline. Right? Bookings were still down by like approximately 40%. Right? In 2021, booking revenue is up by 37% compared to 2019. Okay. So they've done something right. Other than you know, people going to Airbnb a little bit more, they've done something right during that period of time to deliver that growth, right? So let's see what it is. 
they call it as leading the travel rebound through innovation and adaptability the point here is innovation and adaptability okay so the first thing they did is they tried to understand the customer right? and the behavior the psychology and the behavior change that happened during covid so people were less restricted and more flexible when they travel okay so that means that i can do plus or minus 3 days here and there or maybe i i just think about when is the best price so over a week or over a month right they also saw that travel is much widely distributed to the destinations right so they started seeing like that long tail of places like smaller cities smaller towns villages where people want to go and live right where they didn't have a lot of hosts previously right they also saw that people are staying longer during pandemic right for example, there is a good example here the share of stays like 28 days or longer increased from 14% of nights booked to 24% almost like double 10% 10 point increase in q1 to 2021 right it's an indication of lot more people are staying longer with their thing so what did they do they got their act together really well they actually released a lots of features 100 plus features some of the features like included complete revamp of the home screen right so previously the home screen was very different right now the home screen shows something like calendar and i'm flexible right in a place right and options around filtering it they also sorry they also did improvise on their matching algorithm okay. um, so what they found is a lot of people even if they say hey show me uh, prices below 200 dollars if place is little bit better they willing to pay like 220 230 okay. so you'll see that air will be even if you put, put a filter in there there will be places that are slightly above filter right um they also increased you know identifying property the discovery part of it like really well so for example if people want to stay in tree houses you can filter by tree houses across the globe right you might see some properties in san jose compared to properties in like probably thailand you know boats cabins so all types of new filtering in terms of destinations right? um they had bunch of other things like improvised on checkout process once you arrive in a property like you know guide to you know help you go to the complexes improvised on their experiences business you can create like wish list things like that right but the idea is that they really adopted right on the other side like as a host previously they had a lot more steps they actually filtered it down to very few number of steps like 10 steps to post a property right they improvised on their ml algorithm to do better computer vision and like photos and they know exactly what type of photos interest for type of people and show that calling right made it super easy to write text for a post around based on keyword of search volume and and how where you get the maximum click through rate right they also did like multiple other integrations to make it super easy right auto filling you know Once you used to put the property in number of you know bedrooms bathrooms square footage like things like that so overall in q1 2021 50% received a reservation request within 4 days of activation look at that right if you are a host you have a 50% of chance that once you become a host within 4 days you will get the first booking right so that's how they they transition let me also talk about little bit about uber I'll not go really deep into this, but um, look at the Uber Home Screen. How do they deliver growth? Home Screen optimization is a very big thing, right? You can see things like on on the right side. You can see right foot, reservoir right, grocery, like different options. You can see shortcuts here, right? Uber is continuously A/B testing every component of the screen to improvise on conversions. You no. Know, If you go back on my framework, there are four components, right? New user acquisition, activation, and engagement. So those two pillars around activation and engagement is like super key. Um, 
expansion of products into adjacent markets. Right? We, we talked about that part. Like, look at all the options you have as an Uber customer. Right? You have UberX, Uber Comfort, Uber XL, and these are all different prices. And look at how the prices are different. Right? Prices are crossed and written. Right? These are all conversion optimization principles that they are applying on on the screen. Right? You have multiple options. This is where you increase your um, total addressable market right? based on use case. So you might be a premium user, but you want to enable Uber for low income users, right? Low income senior citizens, like every part of the audience needs, needs an option, right? So that's one way to grow. Expansion reads and groceries. Look at all the options they have, like lots of products, transit related product, package delivery is another product, okay? bus is another product, right? So these are all built on a well-known existing technology, but different products for different market segments, right? For different regions across the globe. So, so what do we learn? In, um, the important elements of marketplace are around a few things, right? Provide an amazing customer experience. It needs to be software powered. The retention and use case expansion is super important, right? You want to continue engagement. We talked about the unit economics and how that works. Highly transactional, right? Make it very easy to make the first purchase. You want to build trust. There's a good element of pricing management so that it's a marketplace it manages uh, price really well. You leverage a lot of data and signals to enable all of these components, right? It's a strong data play. KPIs are all of these companies live and breathe with metrics. Okay? So across each of these elements like activation, acquisition, activation, retention, there are many, many metrics being looked at for various reasons. Right? For example, for acquisition, you are looking at cost of customer acquisition. Okay? Activation, you are looking at conversion throughout the funnel. For retention, you are looking at how often are you coming back and use it. So, time difference between each usage, how many times are you using it, what is the value, dollar value you are using, all of these things, right? For scale, you are looking at month over month growth, competitive positioning in the market, right? The lifetime value of a customer, the overall business metrics like revenue margins, unit economics, things like that, right? So who's a good product manager and how do you become one, right? What characteristics do you need as a good product manager in a marketplace? Um, so one of the things that I, I mean, and this is not a comprehensive list, right? For, uh, it's just a perception of, you know, like things that are important. There, I'm, I'm sure there are many things outside of this, like that are also critical, right? But in my mind, a good product manager has skills in writing and articulating or telling the story around why what is needed, because we are all talking about human psychology, customer psychology, as well as making it a seamless, frictionless, like easy to use, like delightful experience on the platform, right? Um, they understand unit economics well. They should have a pretty good bottom up view around why would this make sense compared to why it doesn't, right? If you don't have good unit economic sense, then you are not really building something that is valuable for the customer, right? Market timing is another big one. You don't want to build for today, you wanted to build for the future and where the market goes, right? Rapid prototyping, like a classic use case. Listening skills from the customer and debating skills with the stakeholders, right? I think those are some of the core elements. I want to summarize the interest of time. So if you have to build a marketplace and grow a marketplace, what does that mean? Right? What do we need to do? Right? It starts with simple things. Right? Identify a niche market. Niche could be a market thing, like, hey, you just built for San Francisco market in, in a dark, um, um, you know, particular, right? Make it as niche as possible. Don't go broad, right? so that you understand who your supplier is and who your customer is really well, right? solve one side of the problem, either the supply side or the demand side, depending on how you do it. But a lot more people have seen success solving the supply side first, okay? 
you need to really understand the funnel and optimize on every step, starting with new user acquisition to engagement to retention to scale, right? You want to build an amazing user experience that provides value to the user, make it super easy, frictionless, like delightful experience. If I am able to check out with one click, that's what I want, right? I want the customer to do. Throughout the process, have an eye on how I, how can I increase the lifetime value of the customer by providing products and experiences that are related or in similar segment, right? Understand the unit economics really well and, and metrics really well. And then continue to build systems, processes, and data, right? It's a data ML models and things like that to increase the execution velocity of how fast you can shift features. So that is a summary of you know, how you want to think about logically across all of these things. This is my last slide. I hope you got a lot of value out of some of these. Right? Um, happy to answer any questions you may have. We have approximately 15 minutes. Thank you so much, Rina. It's really, really good material and uh, some interesting learnings around like starting with supply side and how to um, optimize growth at different stages of the customer journey and how to identify those. We've got a couple questions. Let's start with, um, uh, yeah, with Shirish asking, marketplaces generally tend to be winner takes all. If that's the case, why has Lyft survived against Uber? Um, I don't believe it's a winner takes all. Okay, um, you know there are people who has opinion that winner takes all, but in my opinion, marketplace is so large, right? It's so big um, that there is always room for many, many, many different companies. Probably the top three takes a lot of market share, right? Um, like. In US, there is Lyft, there is Uber. In, in many other markets, DD is a big competitor to Uber. Mm -hmm. uh, in India market, Ola and a couple of other players are a lot more dominant, right? So it's, it's nearly a, not as like winner takes off, right? Um, Walmart is competing aggressively with Amazon. Uh, Costco is competing aggressively, aggressively with Amazon, right? Um, like, Eats business, Uber Eats versus DoorDash, right? Um, if you look at the cloud business, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, right? So, so I don't believe it's a winner takes all. Obviously, the earlier you are in the market, you get a. It's harder for to 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 gain more competitive position. And many times, what we have seen, sorry, in many times, what we have seen is. Um, competitors eventually compete, but when they start, they start out in either in different markets or slightly different segments of the market. Right? But then as they expand into other use cases, it, it becomes a, a stronger compete. Yeah, and typically you'll see like two to three dominant players. Uh, and I mean, one will definitely have the large market share, but in most of the marketplaces that you shared in today's presentation, the pie of the market itself, the addressable market itself is significantly large. So there's enough for everyone. Um, yeah, it's a great, great question. Uh, we've got another one uh, from an anonymous attendee. So great info. What are your favorite tools or resources for PMs in charge of growth and scale in an early stage startup? Um, you know, I, I think, um, if you're in an early stage startup or irrespective of where you are, right? Um, tools is just an enabler for you to do a work, right? So it could be like, you know, Zoom is a tool, Slack is a tool, right? And more importantly, I think um, the question is like, how do we continue to learn things that are happening in the market is an important element to it, right? For example, like just the fact that you are attending this session with many others and asking these questions, right? I think that adds a lot of value. You get interest and if you're consistent or you'll have a lot of speakers come in 
and based on their experience, tell you something different, right? So a, a good product manager, in my opinion, is plugged into the market and to the community that is enabling the market, right? And, and it, it's, it's very important to, to learn from others' experiences and have a perspective on it because it helps your career, right? You know, you'll know what people are interested in, what type of people are interested in. And, you know, you can even articulate a good story and see, you know, how you are doing against some of what the industry is doing, right? So be, be super plugged in. There are lots of resources like, you know, in Twitter, newsletters, different product groups, Slack groups, right? Um, pick your favorite ones, right? And be engaged, like read about things like, you know, possibly every day or, you know, a couple of like times a week, like be part of this, right? That's how you build your skill set. Yeah, thank you, Srina. I've got one. <laughs> Others, please uh, chime in with your questions in either chat or Q&A while I'll get the opportunity to ask you another question. How do you enlarge organizations where their teams, um, you know, their growth teams that are focused on acquisition and their retention teams, how is Uber internally structured in the product team? And in your opinion, what kind, and in your experience, what kind of setup has really worked where the acquisition and the retention piece there's an overlap, but how how has how have the teams been structured? Does that yeah. question make sense? Yeah, that, that's a great great question, right? Um, um, there is not. So I can give a couple of examples from my previous uh, you know, jobs, right? Um, usually, the acquisition piece stays within uh, the performance marketing or marketing function. The engagement piece for the growth of team stays a lot more within uh, the product teams. Okay? Because a product team, so product teams are building features, right? And they continue to think about the next feature based on existing customers, a whole lot based on existing customers, what their usage, usage on the platform is and what their needs are, right? So the engagement piece or the retention piece is heavily driven by the product itself. But that being said, there is always like some sort of an overlap there, right? Um, and what has worked really well is like, you know, organizations who understand unit economics and have the right metrics and targets and have a rigor around executing against it actually are the, are the winners, right? The other piece to it is like the culture around rapid experimentation right, is very important for growth. And 70 to 80% of the experiments fail. Um, and, and I'm talking about like engagement related experiences, right? experiments, right? Should I put this button here compared to here? Like how do I continue to deliver higher engagement? How do we merchandise, right? How do we sell it, right? Yeah, what portions do we sell it within the app, right? Uh, things of that nature, right? So what does it work well is like having a culture which is focused around experimentation and execution velocity uh, so that you can quickly identify that winner and continue to scale that winner. All right, thank you. Uh, we've got two more questions. Months from Gary, who asks, who pushes Uber's strategies to adapt? How do you recommend ways to influence your leadership to rapidly adapt? Do you have any specific stories that you can share? Um, so who pushes um, this? So, you know, if you think about strategy, especially in a consumer company, like a marketplace company, um, there is not a single person who owns a strategy, right? There are people um, looking at strategy from different lens. So there are people within product team who thinks about the product strategy. And then there are like within the corporate, like the overall, you know, chief operating, under chief operating officer organization, 
operations organization owns uh, overall company strategy. And there is also a regional strategy. Like in each region, there is a slightly different way of doing business, right? So when I say a region like in, in, in China or India or in developing markets, like, um, you know, they, their needs are very different from a developed market like, you know, Australia or US, I mean, compared to Latin market, right? So there is like regional strategies that different channel managers responsible for that region owns. Okay? So strategy is a, is, is a component of, you know, a mixture of all of these different people coming together and working, right? Um, product strategy on, is under product ownership compared to others. Um, so um, Neha, what was the second part of the question? Um, Do you have specific examples on how you've influenced leadership? Yeah, so, you know, um, in influencing leadership is always uh, an art uh, along with the science. Okay? Uh, the science part of it is that, okay, you wanted to show a lot of numbers, right? And why we are doing what we are doing, right? In in an objective manner. So the so let's say, you know, so for example, right? We are, let's say we wanted to change the home screen. Right? That's a screen with lots of eyeballs, like, you know, hundreds of millions of users, like looking at it every month, right? So how can we change it? Right? And we need to change it right? because we are always need to continuously improve, improve it, right? But leadership will always be, you know, thinking about, hey, that's, that delivers like a hundred fifty billion dollar business a year. We want to be really cautious about the changes that are happening. Right? So the leadership will be coming from that perspective. Right? So if you have to influence them, obviously you need to picture the objective function around what we are doing. Right? Either it increases the engagement on the platform, or more people are clicking through. Right? Things like that. So you have to be really good at that. And the art comes in in terms of how you tell the story. Because many of the things that we wanted to do is very gut-based, right? So, hey, I wanted to change the screen with like multiple tiles into a single tile, okay? So nobody knows if that works or not, right? And that's the, uh, so you, you have to have some level of confidence to take that change and say, yeah, it makes a lot of sense to do that. But then the key here is providing confidence to the leadership that I am doing this in a very constrained manner, like probably 10, 5% of my audience in a particular market is who's going to see the change. And I have an execution velocity to reward back some of these changes. So you will impact revenue if it doesn't go well, but you still have to do it. Uh, so that you you will eventually find that one way to show this, like either as a tile in the square, rectangle, or you know, or a full screen or whatever shape it is. Uh, to get there, you probably have to do like ten different things, right? And once you know that, then you can the, the science comes in as around. Hey, let's continue to expand to larger audience, right? and and the leaders get it. The like good leaders get it that we need to cannibalize some of the revenue and engagement to make improvements. But the question is, like their mind would always go, is this the right people with the right mindset and do we have the right guardrails in place so that it doesn't impact too much, right? So that, that's the way um, generally it works. So a healthy mix of strong data with experimentation and Extremely impressive storytelling, right? <laughs> um, okay, one more question. So uh, Shirisha asks, do you factor in driver acquisition costs into the unit economics for Uber? It seems that this is a significant ongoing cost for Uber. Yes, the answer is yes. So there is always acquisition cost on both sides of the marketplace. Okay. There's a customer acquisition cost and then there's a driver acquisition cost. Um, so they, that is taken into consideration, um, especially in post-COVID. 
situation, we have lots of demand and less number of drivers. Okay, so we are trying to aggressively get more drivers onto the platform. Um, and by providing lots of incentives and you know, many, many different tactics that are employed. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, any other questions, folks? I don't see anything left on chat or Q and A. Got two minutes. Any shout outs? Anyone's, anyone wants to share if they're looking for a job or if they're hiring? This is a good moment to do that. All right. Okay. Uh, last question for Srinath. What is he most excited about on the horizon? Um, I think for for Uber, especially like you know, where we are, I'm working. We are getting into a stage of profitability, okay? uh, which requires a lot of discipline within in the in the company. Um, what profitability enables a company like Uber is further interest from the street, um, which also means that you know, we'll get a lot more investments into growth that we wanted to do in the coming years. Right? So it's a really good time with an Uber, lots of good leaders you know, thinking about how should we grow Uber? How do we change the app? to make it continuously make it better and better. Okay. Um, so lots of interesting projects along that. So, and obviously we are higher. Uh, yeah, there are lots of open roles. Uh, we are trying to get good people in. Yeah, so anyone looking for a job, um, connect with Trina. <laughs> Uh, speaking of which, you know, what is the best way for folks to reach out to you? Um, LinkedIn, or you want to share your email? Either works. <laughs> LinkedIn is the best place. No, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. So just send me a connect or a message and we can go from there. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, folks. Thank you so much, Srinath. I know it's a really busy time for you, and uh, we really appreciate you donating your time and helping our, us learn. I learned a lot. Got some really good takeaways from the deck and your uh, presentation. So thank you once again. Um, and folks, we meet again. Next webinar will be in the first week of December. We look forward to seeing you again. Thank awesome. you. Thank you. thank you. Bye. Yep. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, so this is, uh, chat was recorded. And so join us uh, at products.count.com. And thank you, Shreeth and Neha.